Kia ora and welcome in because, uh, well, we've got a massive guest here, an icon of rugby league. He needs no introduction, so I won't even say your name. How are you, sir? Well, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. I'm very well. Obviously, you've uh, come into the country. Warriors Club consultant, uh, Phil Gould, just in case you weren't aware. Uh, Gus, as a club consultant of the Warriors, first trip to the country. Um, what have you tried to tick off and what have you been successful in ticking off in your first visit? Uh, well, it's not my first visit to the country. I've been here many, many times in the past, but uh, certainly since COVID, it's made that very, very difficult. And this is the first time I've been able to travel here since speaking to the Warriors and, and taking on a consultancy role with them. Um, to that mind, a lot of what we had discussed in the initial stages and what we'd hoped to do and uh, around Warriors Rugby League and New Rugby League in New Zealand has been curtailed by COVID and the fact that, you know, we've got border restrictions and can't get across here. So when the bubble opened, I took what advantage I could of a little space this week to come across and meet people that I'd been conversing with by Zoom and by email and, um, you know, very passionate people in New Zealand about rugby league and stakeholders in the game here that, um, you know, the Warriors have to have a strong relationship with just to, to get an idea of the history of the relationship and where they thought rugby league in, in New Zealand should be headed and what part the Warriors can play in that. And it was part of the conversation I initially had with the Warriors when Mark Robinson and Cameron George rang me. It was kind of like, well, Mark's a new owner of the Warriors. He's a new CEO. Um, the Warriors is as it is today, but, you know, we're going to have to make some big decisions into the future. And we just needed someone uh, we feel has had experience in the game to, to help us not make mistakes virtually. And that was, that was the relationship. I'd also had conversations with um, the NRL about where I thought international football should be going, particularly Pacifica and New Zealand. Um, I'd written columns in Australia uh, regarding development of player development and the international game. And it was off the back of that that actually Michael Maguire, the New Zealand national coach, and Greg Peters from New Zealand Rugby League first called me to talk about their situation. And on the back of that came the Auckland Rugby League, who obviously through COVID were looking at their business and their role in rugby league here in New Zealand. And third was the Warriors rang after that. So, so they were last to the yeah, party. Yeah, so I was actually, I'd actually been talking to all the stakeholders before the Warriors even called. And so it all fit in nicely and it, it, it fit in with what uh, Peter Volandis and I had been discussing in Australia about the, the future of the international game. But of course, uh, we've been spinning our wheels because we can't travel and uh, the NRL is looking at so many other things and money is tight all over the place and um, they're trying to keep the competition going across there and every time we get a little spike there's a threat of a close down so mm. life has changed for all of us. Yeah. You know, we can't go crook because people have lost their livelihoods and people have lost their lives and loved ones so um, you know, we're still just a sport but um, it's made advancement very difficult at the moment. So with all those emails and the Zoom calls and the limited international travel, what have you actually ascertained are the, the key problems? Like what, what's broken might be a little too harsh, but what, what is in need of urgent attention when it comes to New Zealand rugby league as a whole? Well, at, at, at the end of the day, I'm a consultant to the Warriors, so I, I work for the Warriors. And um, one of the first things that happened when the Warriors finally came together in January up in Tamworth for a camp, uh, Cameron George asked me to speak to the club to speak to the group as a sort of an introduction. They'll finally all together. Because prior to Christmas, we had half in Kiama in New South Wales training and half over here in New Zealand training with Nathan Brown. And I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, anything, whatever you like. And so the first thing I did was, was virtually ask the question to everyone in the club, what does it mean to be a warrior? Mm. What, what, is it a New, what is a New Zealand warrior? What does it mean to be a part of this club, whether you're working or playing or coaching? And, and how do, we, how do we typify what a warrior is? And, you know, what do you think people might say when they refer to the warriors? How would they describe the warriors from the outside looking in? And how do we describe the warriors that we want it to be? And, you know, when people look at your logo and your jersey, when we want them to feel something, we want them to believe something, we want them to expect something. What do they think about the warriors? And what would you like them to think? How honest were they? Well, they were. They were sort of immediately pretty reflective about it. So from internally, from a culture sense and from a leadership sense, I guess, and they're things that you don't get the answer right straight away and you've sort of got to delve into, your, into the honesty of it all mm. um, to see where you want to be. And it's, I guess most businesses during COVID have, have had times of reflection. The NRL certainly done it. 
I'm sure all 16 NRL clubs doing it, business everywhere are doing it. It's just reflecting on a new world and how we would like to look. And from a Warriors perspective, you know, with new owners and, and moving forward, who do they represent? What do they represent? How are they perceived? And, and, and you know, what is, what does it mean to be a part of this club? And that's that's a journey that um, that they're now embarking upon. And then obviously that their relationship with the other stakeholders in New Zealand. So you your New Zealand Rugby League, who look after the national team, and your Auckland Rugby League, which are probably your biggest rugby league organisation, and then the other zones around the country and um, and other participants. And you know, there are plenty of other stakeholders they have corporately and sponsors and members and fans and um, and how they relate to them. So it's a it's a it's a whole range of things that clubs need to consider as they go forward, trying to be the club that they want to be and have the impact they want. So uh, that's. That's where that was the starting point. So the idea is now then to get around and talk to the stakeholders and see how they see things in New Zealand and how they see the game of rugby league from a school's perspective. I went to a school yesterday and watched one of the college games and spoke to people at the coalface. I like to talk to people that have been in the game at the coalface, uh, both in schools and junior league, and then uh, sort of certainly meetings with the New Zealand rugby league. And I spent plenty of time today with the Auckland rugby league, plenty of times with the, the Warriors boys, um, Tony Yero and... Uh, Stacey Jones yesterday uh, talking about the development squads over here and so difficult for the Warriors, you know, being in Australia and not knowing when they're coming home and, yeah. and not only for their own personal things about extended family and living away from home, etc., but for the Warriors itself to stay and connect with their country and stay and connect with their, their stakeholders and fans and members here and everything would be so much better if they were just back in New Zealand and like, like it used to be, playing home and away. But... We can't have that at the moment. So they're meeting those challenges as, as well as planning, you know, what's the club look like into the future? Mm. That it's been uppermost in their mind to get home at some stage, you know, whilst, you know, working behind the scenes, whilst as a group resigning themselves to the fact that they're there for the season because unless mentally the players and coaches and, uh, and families understand we're here for the season, don't let hope get in the way that we're going to get home earlier. We're here for the season. Because mm. every time we say, well, we might be home by this, I might be home by that, and we don't do it, that's just a, another thing that we've got Distracts. to deal with. It's, yeah, it's, it yeah. is. And it's, so it's, this is where we're going. We're going to the end of the season. We're going to see the seasons out, so we'll steal ourselves to do that. Then behind the scenes, there are obviously all the, the opportunities to get back because this is dearly where they want to be. Mm. But if they come back for one game and suddenly there's a spike in New Zealand or a case and both teams are stuck here, yeah. the next round doesn't go around in the, in the NRL. And if, if they come back for one game, do they bring their families back with them and then suddenly find themselves caught over here and can't get back to their families? And, you know, so do they bring their families back and then can we take them all back if we've got to go into quarantine? Mm. So there's a lot of considerations. And most of that is driven by the NRL. So from a Warriors perspective, they would love nothing more than to get home as soon as possible. So you're getting a bit of, not pushback, but maybe a little bit of resistance from Volandis and it's, the NRL? It's not, no, it's not resistance, it's reality. Yeah. It's just reality. The, the, there is no doubt that we're still living in an uncertain time. And I know we can say we've got a, bu a bubble and it's fine. And I'm, I'm probably taking a risk coming here. I've got to be back to call the football Friday night. You know, so if suddenly... <laughs> I hope you get back safely. If suddenly <laughs> just in the clothes at the airport, I'm in trouble. Can you do it over Zoom? <laughs> probably you not. Might be able to. Probably not. But, um, I'm sure they've got someone to replace me. But <laughs> it's... Um, yeah, so it, it's... They're difficult questions to answer, you know. Mm. And even going forward, how do we know that next year is going to be any different or the year after or the year after? And how can the NRL put their competition in jeopardy... Um, and, and these are these are reality things. It's not throwing up challenges for the sake of no. throwing them up. They are reality things. So when the season's over, I'm sure you know the boys and their families will want to get home here to New Zealand and and, um, and and spend the summer here and meet extended family and relax again. But what happens in the future, I, I can't tell you. I can't guarantee. No one can. No one can. The NRL have got to look after their competition. They've got to look after their broadcasters and the people who bring the revenue in. And they will, I guess, within reasonable risk, make a decision as to when that might happen. Now, whether it happens full-time, part-time, or every now and then, I don't know. I can't answer that question. I'm 100% certain that guys like yourself and Cameron George, Nathan Brown, Roger Tuivasa Sheck, you're sitting down and you're trying to figure out the best course of action as the season uh, continues to unfold. 
uh, one of the possibilities that was tabled, maybe by someone from the media, maybe Cameron George, was these Mercy Dash missions mm. where you put two teams on a plane, obviously the Warriors, in this case the Dragons in round 16, get them on a plane in and out straight away. So the team would still be based in Australia, but they'd still be able to service yeah. their long-suffering fans. Is, is that something that is still...? They're looking at all options. Yeah. They are. They're looking at all options. And it's not that they don't want to do it. It's not mm. that the NRL doesn't want to do it. It's realistic risk, whether or not yeah. they should or could. Now, we could do it, but if something goes wrong, it causes a major problem. Yeah. So that's what they're looking at. I mean, there's an opportunity, I think, round 21, 22, we play Sharks and Bulldogs back-to-back, -back, supposedly home games. Yeah. You know, Warriors could come out for a week and play two oppositions for a week, but... Is that a risk that the NRL is willing to take? I, I don't know. So it's not as though they don't want to and it's not as though I don't want to give you an answer. I haven't got an answer. And I don't sit in on those meetings, by the way, because oh, not? No, that's, not my, that's not my charter. That's not my job description. So, um, you know, I'm sure Cameron and Mark Robinson and, and the coaches and uh, the senior player group are discussing this all the time because during the off-season... I know at the end of last season uh, there were a number of meetings you know, reviewing the way the year went last year, the problems that it caused, um, the players in in Australia without their families and the, the senior players making a decision, well, if we're coming back next year, it has to be with families, we have to be in the one place. And, you know, and, and they were much better organised this year than last year. Last year it happened overnight and, mm. and they had to, a lot of things to deal with. So the senior players and the management had a number of meetings during the off-season to then take a list of demands to the NRL and say, well, this is what it's going to look like. Mm. Uh, and the NRL have been nothing more than accommodating because uh, we've, um, they put them in a camp in Tamworth for a month and then now, now they're at Terrigal and um, they're staying in uh, you know, holiday apartment accommodation. Some of the single boys have gone out and got places on their own and rented them out just for a little bit of distance and relief and a bit of privacy. And they've got a, a nice training facility at Tugra. It's not home, but... That's their second home over there at the moment and they're making the best of it and I think they're doing a really good job. Yeah, and I suppose one of the other considerations, despite the you know, travel, put that to one side, you've got guys who probably haven't played at Mount Smart Stadium before, mm. haven't been to Auckland, and then if they relocated, all of a sudden they're trying to find accommodation here, mm. vehicles, all that sort of stuff, and do they really need that on their plate as well as trying to make the top eight? Absolutely, and you know, and they've... We had, I think, a squad of 14 or 15 training at Kiama prior to Christmas, so we decided not to bring them to New Zealand straight away. And they were recruits that Peter O'Sullivan had made in Australia. Uh, so you're adding Fanua Blakes and Ewan Aikens and these types of fellas, Josh Currens and that, were, were over there in Australia, so they trained there prior to Christmas. Um, so those fellas haven't come to Australia yet, haven't come to New Zealand yet and yeah. organised where they're going to be living. And um, you know, they've got kids, they've got to pull a kid, put kids in schools and they've got to pull kids out of schools. Mm. And, how long am I there for? So there's a lot to consider. I, I don't think people really appreciate what the Warriors are going through. I really don't. And I don't think they see the enormity of what they're actually achieving at the moment either. I think it's, um, uh, you know, having, having seen it at much closer quarters and been involved with the club, you know, since the end of last season, um, I can see what the challenges are and I can see how they're really galvanising together to, to do what they're doing, mm. which I think is pretty fantastic. Well, let's talk about their progression since you've come on board as the club consultant. How happy are you with, with what you've seen? Because, you know, as you pointed out, very difficult circumstances to relocate the team, family members, kids, to Australia and then still put up really decent efforts in the toughest rugby league competition in the world. Yeah, they've been phenomenal. Uh, so they were in Tamworth. Uh, I, I watched half the squad train... Uh, in Kiama prior to Christmas and it was mainly physical work and there wasn't much they could do from a team perspective, some skills work. When the squads came together in Tamworth, um, very impressive. The, the, the facilities that Tamworth provided for them and the way they went about their work, how hard they trained during that month. Now, I would normally drive up early Wednesday morning to get there for the Wednesday session and leave Friday night after the last one. Uh, we had a sportsman's, lunch, a sportsman's dinner up there, which I stayed in. I uh, was one of the guest speakers at and that sort of thing. So uh, four weeks in a row, <clears throat> I drove from home to Tamworth to spend two or three days around the camp. And, and I'm not involved in the coaching or the recruitment or any of those sort of mechanical things around the team, but it was great to observe it. And they trained as hard as any team I've ever seen. They, you know, they, they did it well and coaching staff were terrific. 
They then had to transport all that to Terrigal for the, to their permanent home. And um, again, I go up a couple of mornings a week, so I get up early, four, four in the morning, and I live on the other side of Sydney. I've got to get through town before the before all the traffic, the traffic and yeah. then get up to Tugger, have some breakfast, go over and watch the boys train. I feel a bit useless because I'm not, you know, that's not part of my job. That's not what I'm, that, that I'm only there in a supportive role because, you know, I've been taken on as a consultant to the club, but we can't be doing the other stuff that I'm supposed to be doing. So, so. are you finding use for yourself and other No, theories? I feel useless. I feel useless. Well, you're not useless because <laughs> yeah. no, but it's, it's, you've got so much yeah. intel up here. Yeah, no, it's got to be... Um... The, thing, the thing it's been for me is I've met uh, so many wonderful people. I mean, truly wonderful people, some of the best people I've ever met in rugby league. They're a very, very special group of players and, and Mark and, um, and Cameron themselves are great blokes and uh, coaching staff. Have, I've been very impressed. I've been very impressed with everything they're doing. They've had no luck. I mean, they've had injuries. They haven't been able to get their best players on the field and even in games, you know, I think we can see in the NRL competition there's a big divide between the top three or four teams and the rest and you're going to have trouble beating those sides. So the rest are all sort of in a clump and in those fellas when they play each other, the Warriors are probably going to play 15 or 16 games this year that are in the balance with five minutes to go. And some they're winning and some they're losing. And that's just that's just where they are as a team at the moment. The aim is to get beyond that and, and up into regular top eight contention and uh, win the games that they should win and then start to challenge the better sides even better. You mentioned the injuries and, and how they do take a toll on the Warriors. You, you had uh, a long history with the Sydney Roosters another team that has had a massive injury toll, but because of, I'm assuming, the, the building blocks that you put in place long ago at that club, they, they seem to survive and just keep on pushing on. They can bring in guys who are part of this amazing system and not much really changes. So is that where the Warriors will eventually get to, in your opinion, like with a little bit of time and the right structures put in place, that, that will happen to the Auckland-based team? That's where every team should be. Mm. That's what a professional football club should look like. It's how it should operate. Uh, with that vertical integration of talent from the time they come into your system and uh, 15 or 16 years of age and then how prepared they are for their NRL debut whenever that may come. And, you know, the, the, the true sign of developing young talent is at what age do you try them against open age and against men? And, some handle it at 18, some don't handle it till they're 22, 23. You've got to have a level of development and a level of football for all of them. But if you bring your system along like that, where the majority of your squad, and I mean the majority, the vast majority of your squad, your top 30, are players that came to you as teenagers and developed through, whether it be the Rooster way, you know, the Bulldog way, the Panther way, the Bronco way, if they come through your system, then things like dealing with injury crisis and suspensions becomes a lot easier and mm. players making their debut is not as daunting as, you know, what some other clubs are facing, you know. Um, with respect to the Warriors, you know, some of the blokes that, that have had the debut for the Warriors during these times uh, themselves haven't had much rugby league mm. IQ. They've been sort of in other systems and, and even rugby. So Rocco Berry, yeah, Elias sure. Katoa. That's, that's, that's not easy to do, you mm. know. Um, and the, war and the Roosters too, I mean, they've, they've got eight or ten internationals, which helps how <laughs> yeah. young blokes come in. Like, they've got an 18-year-old halfback who looks like he's, you know, killing everything at the moment, but he's playing in that team. Mm. It might look very different if he was playing for one of the lower teams, so he's, he's fortunate he's debuting with such a strong club. But that's where everyone needs to get to. You look at the Panthers, uh, where I had a, a long involvement there for eight years up there, and the system that's in place... Um, they are the youngest team in the competition. They are the team with the least NRL experience. They're undefeated after 10 rounds. They're the most exciting. Well, their reserve grade are undefeated. Their mm -hmm. under-20s have lost one game. Like, there's, it's, it's, it's phenomenal, the culture and, and, uh, of what they bought. And now what's taking over is chemistry. Culture is your long-term, what does it mean to be a warrior? What does it mean to be a panther? What, sign what do, what's... What makes us different to everyone else? What brings us together? Mm -hmm. Chemistry is what wins your premierships. That's your players at the right age and the right stage of their career and their right stage of development where it all gels together and, you know, injuries are light and the opportunities are great and that's when you win your premiership. So there's a big difference between culture and chemistry. You need the culture, but you need every now and then the chemistry to win and that's, 
that's where those top sides are at the moment. They've how, got great chemistry. How do you coach that or how do you teach it or is it just something that naturally happens? All of a sudden you're in this outstanding culture, you start winning a few games, everybody starts enjoying each other's company a little bit more and then that's when it happens? Well, it's something you have to experience to recognise, I guess. You know, so I've been very fortunate in my career in rugby league to have experienced it on a number of occasions where you can feel it. Um, the first time you feel, you, the first time it happens, you probably didn't realise it, but you know it's different. And then you start to see it in others, and then you coach and you start to cultivate it and create it and bring the people together that you think can form that sort of chemistry. And that's when you start to look at players the way you do. And and that's what I think Peter O'Sullivan, the recruitment manager, and Nathan Brown are looking at players that can make a difference, um, not just to the culture of the team, but to the chemistry of the team over the next few years and where the Warriors draw their players from over the next decade. Um, you know, I, I would like to think that it would be one of the Warriors' aims to, to reflect the demographic of this country and to have a lot of their talent come to them from pathways built here in, in New Zealand and, and we probably need to strengthen those pathways to what they are currently at the moment. There's a lot of young talent that's taken away from New Zealand at a very young age by NRL clubs who are looking for, uh, for talent and they've taken out of the country at very young ages. So we need to find a way or at least give them another choice or another option that if they want a pathway through to the NRL, then the Warriors is the place you can do it. So what do you want for the Warriors as we move forward into 2022 and the years beyond? Is it, is it more of a development pathway into first grade or do you still get Nathan Brown and co to look out for those big name signings a la Adam Fanua Blake? Well, it's, it's always a combination of both. Um, but to build the culture of your club, I think you need to develop talent from a younger age. And I think the teams that are at the top of the table reflect that. Mm. And I think um, there is plenty of anecdotal evidence to suggest that's the way to do it. Trying to recruit success doesn't work for anyone. You might strike pay dirt every now and then, you might get lucky, but sustainable success, it doesn't work with just pure recruitment. Mm. Um, now the Roosters, it's an interesting exercise because when I went there in 1995, they had been a recruitment, they had no junior league. They got no junior league, a you know, very, very tiny junior league, you know, so they would become a recruitment club. Um, but with the systems that we put in place and the way it's been continued so brilliantly since that time, I know that Panthers with the biggest junior league and the Roosters with no junior league were constantly playing off against each other in junior league premiership grand finals because their system and their system were different, mm. but it still revolved around bringing kids in as teenagers and teaching them the rooster way to play and the rooster culture. And it was just better than what other, other, other clubs were providing. And, um, you know, and I think that's the way you build a club. I think that's the way the Warriors will build their next successful era. You know, the, the reality is, and it's one of the things that I first spoke to the group about when asked to talk, was that you know, since the grand final in 2011, 11, yeah. uh, they've made one finals appearance and lost that game. So they've won a semi-final for 10 years. Mm. Is that what we want the Warriors to be? No. no. Well, how do we change that? How do we go back every year? How do we, how do we make the top eight, you know, eight out of 10 years? How do we challenge for a title every decade? Which I think is what most NRL teams should aspire to. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, at the moment we've seen a lot of clubs do it right for a long period of time. Some have their day in the sun and we don't hear of them again for a long time. And, you know, for the Warriors to be consistently successful is so important to the selling of the game here in New Zealand and making it a, an optimal choice for young men coming through and young girls, obviously, that want to play the game as well, um, that the Warriors is, is where, you, where you can do it. You can, you can fulfil your dream there. And we hope that they aspire to wear a Warriors jersey. Simple as that. The question I've got after all of that, Phil, is it might be like how long is a piece of string, but you've when? had... Yeah. Don't like, say when. How long does it take? It takes as long as it takes. <laughs> and it never ends. The, the process never ends. You know, it, it, takes it, it takes until you get that core group of players that come through that have just got that chemistry. Yeah, right. That's, you know, that's the truthful answer. Mm. Um, and we've seen a lot of clubs... A lot of clubs fall into the trap of, well, we'll just go out and recruit a little bit of success to get the media and the fans and everyone off our back. And then when we've had that bit of success, then we'll start the long-term project. Mm. Doesn't work. Mm. You know, we see them get themselves in trouble salary cap-wise and 
cheat salary caps. They try to stay afloat and, you know, we've had a few of those and it doesn't work. You know, the best and the, the most, you know, consistent way to do it, to build consistent success, is to develop talent. That's my belief. Now, if a club doesn't want to do that, that's their business. If the Warriors don't want to do that, that's their business. But as a consultant, if they want my advice, that's what my advice is. And that's what I'm looking towards. And when I can actually get around to doing it and, and speak to enough people to formulate an opinion on it and, and make a recommendation, then it'll be up to the Warriors to decide, well, do we want to go down that path or do we want to keep going out and trying to find players from Australia to come over here and get us a few wins? Um, I know what I would prefer. Mm. One of the guys that you have managed to attract to the club, this fantastic young kid, Reese Walsh, 18 years of age, and he just he does not look out of place. And I'm, I'm really interested in getting your thoughts on him because how do you, how do you best utilise him? I, I'm assuming he's, he's been brought in to be the long-term replacement for Roger once he leaves to Rugby Union, but we've seen what he can do in the halves as well with those dazzling feet and the line breaks and the tries. So what's his best position in, in your eyes? Well, first of all, I didn't bring him in. The club brought him in. Peter O'Sullivan identified the talent and the club sold itself to the boy to make a big decision in his life at 18 years of age. I mean, he was with the Broncos. Mm. It's, you know, you're talking about the, you know, supposedly the marquee club of the, the whole competition. Um, Peter O'Sullivan identified the talent and I think our club knew some time ago that Roger was considering a, a, um, a, a dream to go and play rugby and, and probably at the end of 2021 when that was going to happen. So um, Peter O'Sullivan thought this kid fit the bill and fit the, the profile of what he would want for the club. He's still very young. He's got to be protected. Um, he's got to be looked after. And, but he couldn't have had a more astonishing start to his career than what he's shown. And I know he's got everybody really excited. I just hope that we, we protect him from himself because he's got no fear um, and he's, he's only 18 and uh, we want to make sure that he's, you know, he's looked after, but crikey, he plays with no hesitation. He's got so much skill, you know, and what I do know, and this reflects the, the personality of a person like, like Roger Tulvasashek, who's obviously still our best player, um, but he came to his first training session, Reese Walsh, and there was no guarantee that he was going to play with the Warriors this year. He was still on contract to the Broncos, but in the end, there was a decision made to let him go, and you know, the Warriors can thank the Broncos for that. But Reese Walsh turned up to his first training session and trained against the first grade side that was playing that weekend. So everyone else opposed session against the you know, to play like the opposition's going to play, and the Warriors practice their defence and practice their attack, and that's how the scrimmage session works. And it's full on, full body contact, and Reese Walsh carved them up. <laughs> I mean, literally carved them up. Wow. And. Roger Tuivasa-Shek said after training, he went over to Nathan, he said, if you want to move me, move me. He said, mm. put him in. Now, if you remember earlier in Roger Tuivasa-Shek's career, Roger Tuivasa-Shek spent several years on the wing. Anthony Minicello at Because Anthony Minicello was yeah. the gun, you know. Yeah. So he probably was taking some sort of experience from that in the development of his football and thinking, you know, I'm going and, you know, I'm the leader of this place and I want that kid in the team. If it's got to be my position, I'll play somewhere else. And we've seen it happen already a couple of times. I mean, Reese debuted at fullback in Melbourne, which was a very tough ask. Roger played on the wing. And we've seen him come off the bench a couple of times since, once at 5'8". And on the weekend, he came off the bench at fullback. So the coaches are exploring with options. They're still not convinced they're using him right. They don't know if and when he should start a game and if he does, what, what happens to Roger. But... Roger and Nathan will work that out. Mm. Uh, what we do know is that the Warriors can be very excited about this young talent. Um, and there are a few others, yeah, you haven't seen yet. I've, there, are some, there are some kids that Peter O'Sullivan has signed to the club that are as good as any teenagers I've seen in any system. And, um, you know, some of them haven't had a lot of rugby league in their life, so we're trying to get them as much IQ as they can before they have to debut. But, um, you know, I think there are, there are some good times ahead. And, Certainly that kid's going to excite a lot of people for a long time. Yeah, well, Nathan Brown, I mean, it's a happy headache to have, isn't it? You know, where do you yeah, put and, this and, and, gun and player? You've got to be responsible for the kid too. Like, he's, 
He's 18. I mean, the first week against the Cowboys, they sort of snuck him in at 5'8". The Cowboys didn't know, so didn't target him. The next week, they threw him on at 5'8". Manly were ready for him, and he's never defended in the front line before and made it very difficult for him. The thing I was impressed about, because he went out he went out there, the Trebojevic has really targeted him and made a few breaks past him and that. And I thought, gee, that might knock his confidence in. As soon as we got the ball, he's telling people where to go, what to do. He's putting up <laughs> kicks, scoring tries. And, and I'm well, thinking, he's been doing all his life. Like, like he'd been there the whole time. It was just yeah. extraordinary. And, you know, I'd imagine that, that Nathan's under some pressure to play him, but also uh, with the understanding and experience that he's got to be protected too. And uh, Roger Tuovasasek showed his real club quality and his spirit. He's, he said, I'll play somewhere else if you want to play in fullback. Mm. Nathan Brown, um, a guy with a lot of experience first year with the Warriors. Why should fans of the side be excited that this is the guy at the helm leading the Warriors into the future? I think because he's team first, he's player first. I think he, you know, I often say to young coaches, um, you work for the players, they don't work for you. You work for your staff, they don't work for you. And the minute they feel it's all about you, you're in trouble. And I think that's where a lot of coaches fall down. Now, Nathan, um, you know, he, he's had a few stints at coaches at different, the players at different clubs, but he, he remains very much a development coach, a skills-based coach, a team-first based coach, and he's got a really nice relationship with his players up there at the moment. Um, Justin Morgan and, Craig, and Slade Griffin and Craig Hodges, they make a really good team. I've been really impressed with the work that they've done, and these players are well prepared every week. They, you know, it's a knowledge-based and a, a, a skills-based type program that they run. Um, they're not getting it 100% right at the moment, the players, but you know, it's, it's part of a journey for them. It's probably different to what they've been used to, and it can only get better over time. So I've always rated Nathan. I rated Nathan as a player, and I rated Nathan as a coach, and I know he, he had a couple of hiccups early on in his career, but um, he's always been a development-minded person to develop the club to be stronger and, and leave it better when he leaves. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with that you can be confident you've got a club-minded coach on your books and someone who's determined to leave the club in a better, in a better place than he found it, whenever that might be. You know, and I think given the number of changes that the Warriors have had over the last decade, it would be nice to have a coach to spend a decade here in the same Absolutely. system and, and, and players you know, have the, uh, the leadership of someone who's, who's been around a fair bit. So um, we wish him all well. I've, I've always rated Nathan and... Um, and from where, from where I sit, he's, he's doing a terrific job. When was your first interaction with him? Oh, many years ago. I used to coach against teams he played in yeah. when he was playing with the Dragons back in the day. And, with um, the long flowing locks. Long flowing locks, yeah. Um, yeah, he was always a crafty player and they all said he'd make a good coach and um, I think he would agree he got his opportunity too soon and probably at the wrong place. He became coach of the Dragons mm. probably when he wasn't ready. Um, Everyone remembers the yeah. slap. Then he went across to England and I uh, said, so go and get some silverware over there. And he came back into a difficult situation at Newcastle when they won three wooden spoons in a row. But his work up there was very good and he left the club in a, uh, a much better position than what he found it. Um, probably didn't get to finish his work up there, which often happens with clubs and, um, and boards who get frustrated with results. But, um, you know, when when the coaching position became available here, Mark Robinson had always been impressed. I think Nathan must have done some work during the off-season the previous year. He'd come in with Stephen Kearney and done That's some right. work. That's yeah. right, yeah. And Mark just liked his personality and liked the way he went about his business and um, virtually made a decision within days. He said, I, I want Nathan Brown to be the coach of the Warriors. and. You know, there was no, oh, no opposition from anyone else, so that's, that's how it worked out. Mm. And I think you got a good one. I think you got a good one. He's, he works very hard. We've got a good one in Adam Fanua Blake. Man, mm. that mm. guy is an impressive specimen. Any ideas how far away he is from coming back? Because, you know, he makes such a difference when he's out there for the Warriors. Yeah, so I, I was in Brisbane. On the Tuesday of last week, uh, I saw him running and his gait looked pretty good. But it was the first time I'd seen him running. So I would imagine with the injury he's got, he was probably three or four weeks away from that point, which is a lot okay. better result than when it happened because yeah. they thought it was the season. Um, he'd had a very unique injury around his patella region with a bone um, that they thought would have to be grafted. And he has a PCL ligament injury in the back of his knee. But when they had further x-rays and examination, this would mend on itself. So he avoided surgery, which was a big bonus. 
and uh, he's a big man. I mean, he's going to have to work hard to get get mm. get the strength and everything back into it, and he bounces around, so it's not as though he treats his legs kindly, you know. Um, so he's going to have to be 100%. But the effect he had, or the way he was, you know, the way players looked at, at Adam Fanua Blake during the off season and his voice at training, he's a real alpha male. He's a very, very strong-willed man and very good trainer and very strong. And the way he played in the opening game of the season when they beat the Titans, you know, the Titans were touted as a top eight side and mm. the big the team on the rise. And you know, the Warriors beat him pretty comfortably that day. And Adam Fanua Blake was, was enormous. And... Um, but you know, a couple of weeks later and he's not there and it's it's left a real hole. There's no doubt about that. So it'll be good to have him back. It's even been good you know, having him at training and listening to his voice in the, the video meetings and that sort of thing as well. Mm. He's, a, he's, he's, he's a student of the game. He knows the game really well. He's been really well coached in his career, obviously, and um, he's, he's been a really good boy. It sounds like he trains uh, like he plays as well. Uh, Adam Blair, who retired at the end of last season, has been doing a lot of stuff for... Sky Sport on game day coverage and Warriors TV and he was saying um, Bunty R4, uh, one of his first runs back at training, he obviously spent a lot of time on the sidelines last year and over here in New Zealand, he's hitting the ball up and who does he meet? Adam Fanua Blake cuts him in half, mm. said don't run at me like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's what the good ones do. Yeah. Um, no, there's no half measures, there's nothing soft about him, you know, no. training or playing and he's... Um, now he's what I call a real alpha male. He's a leader, um, and uh, he's he's had he's had an effect, and he's been a loss not to have him there because at the time he was he was really forging something with the other players, and, and it'll be good to get him back on the field. I'm sure for those blokes. Mm. Just away from the Warriors, you would have seen a lot of ARL or NRL crackdowns in your time. I remember one years ago where they cracked down on the play the ball, mm -hmm. and if you didn't play it square and ruck your foot back slowly. Then a penalty was blown. This one is a bit more serious, uh, you know, addressing head contact and the like. H how, how do you feel the NRL have approached this? Obviously, it's important that we um, take into consideration the welfare of the players, but at this time of the year, where it's mid season, is that a weird time to try and make an adjustment for the players? How long have you got? Um, Craig, how long have we got here? <laughs> as long as you want. Okay, as long as we want. <laughs> That's a very long answer. That's a very long answer. Uh, Can you yeah, give it to it, us in bullet points? In rugby league, we love a good crackdown because we've, <laughs> we've, we've had plenty over the years. Yeah. And I remember um, I was on my way to the um, to the magic round on the weekend, and um, um, uh, there were some people from Sky up there that we were meeting and, and, and talking to up there, and I had some other meetings to go to, and mm. um, and I saw a social media post that. There was going to be this crackdown on high tackles and people would be sent to the sin bin. And I just wrote on Twitter, I said, what could possibly go wrong? You know, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I felt about it. Everything. <laughs> Everything could go yeah, wrong. Look, and look, I know what they're doing. I know what they're, what they're trying to do. Um, I know, I knew immediately there would probably be an overreaction in the early part of it. Mm. But um, Peter Volandi's points out that obviously the one... At, Pappenhausen at the back end of it, you know, where a player is knocked out and can't continue the game with a legal tackle and yeah. face a long suspension. He figures if we all, if we get the minor ones, maybe that one stops and that's where he is. And I know there's a whole, you know, concussion's the big word and player welfare's the big word and, and all I sing at the moment. Um, I, I have deliberately not got into the debate around concussion because the minute you do, you are held down by people who take the moral high ground and get on a soapbox and they talk about a subject that they haven't really researched, you know, and there is a lot of misinformation out there about concussion and the effects of this thing called CTE. If you want to sound really intelligent, work out what the long term of that is. I call it CTE because I'm not that intelligent. But if neither you, am I. Yeah, if you read the research, if you read the research, I just urge people to read all the research about it because media and public opinion and is getting way ahead of the science. It's way ahead of the research. You know, it's jumping to conclusions that may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is that I want our players thinking that they're going to have major problems in life if they cop a bump on the head playing rugby league, which is where we're at at the moment. Now, obviously, you know, sporting codes are fearful of litigation and people coming back with class actions and 
Whether or not that happens, I don't know. And whether or not that would even be successful, I don't know. Everyone wants to draw a comparison with the USA. Different country, different code, different type of game, litigious system. You know, whether we would face that here in Australia, I highly doubt it. That's my personal opinion. That's the opinion I've spoken to legal people about. But I'm not in charge of the game either. I'm not in charge of the welfare of the game into the future. And Peter Volandis wouldn't take these actions lightly if he didn't think he needed to protect the game from something. So, one, he thinks he's doing the right thing with player welfare. Two, I think in the back of his mind is the fact that he's protecting the game and indemnifying the game for what may or may not happen down the future. Mm. But I urge people to actually read the research on this because the one thing through all this I'm saying to Peter is don't keep advertising this as what our game is because junior sport is not like that. Junior sport is safe. We have that many studies around the play safe policies we have in junior rugby league these days that, you know, mum, you know, the anecdote, mum won't let little Joey play because of what she sees on TV. We have to get away from that narrative and, and, and sell the safety of our junior league football. This is the professional code. We don't try this at home. That's what the big boys are doing at the moment. They're doing their best. Every now and then there's a slip up, but that's what it is. Mm. They expect it. That's why they play it. That's the people they are. But this sport here, this is a great thing for your kid to be involved in team activity, healthy, active lifestyles, learning about dealing with others and friendships, and, and it's a great sport to play. A very, very minor percentage, an infinitesimal percentage of these kids are going to come through to the NRL. Mm. And they're, they're a different breed. And when they come through to the NRL, their bodies will be built, they'll be mentally ready, and they'll, they'll take on whatever it's thrown at them up there. Um, so it's the message I want to sell. You know, don't listen to everything you read and hear. Do the research. Go and listen, look at it and understand that the junior sport of our game is a great sport for kids and it's safe. And I don't want that to detract away from what a great sport it can be for the kid and the development of your child, you know, young boy or young girl. It's, mm. it's a great involvement. So that's where I get a little bit frustrated with the whole thing. Um, what happened on the weekend, crackdown. They'll sort, the coaches and players will sort it out. They'll, they'll work it out over the next few weeks and they'll work out a tackle technique for it. It's not easy to change in a week. Mm. Um, but um, obviously it's not because they kept doing it all weekend, didn't they? Like, even though there have been six games before, someone knocked one, someone out in game seven. It's yeah. not as though they're stupid. It's just how it is, things are at the moment anyway. Well, the Warriors managed to adjust because... Warriors Eels, we didn't see a sin bin. No. So I mean, it's it's possible, right? We're well, down twenty four nil too. So that was... that's true. Yeah. Well, maybe they should have resorted to smacking them in the head. No, do not do that. We don't encourage that. We don't condone it. Please uh, play responsibly. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, just before you go, uh, Wairangi Korpu, uh, former Warrior himself, uh, he wanted to know how you're getting on with um, house hunting in South Auckland. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not thinking about a move just yet. <laughs> oh, you're not? No. <laughs> no. No. Because no. the property down south, I mean, it's pretty expensive these days. You, you'd be well aware that there's People a have told me I, boom. I've had a good drop around. Well, property booms everywhere. Property yeah. boom in Australia too, you know. Um, yeah, we haven't got to that point yet. And, it's, and I'm still, as I say, feeling a little bit guilty at the moment that, that we can't get on and do some of the things that I was supposed to be doing. But um, in good time, when we can sort the COVID situation out and sort the travel out and... The Warriors can get themselves back home to their home base and, you know, it's just a lot of things are put on hold at the moment that they'd like to be doing because they're battling with other challenges right at the moment. Mm. Just finally, and thank you so much for spending so much of your Pleasure. time with, with us today, the nickname Gus, because it's something that, you know, it's just synonymous. You're not Phil, you are Gus Gould. Mm. Where, where did Gus come from? My mother calls me Philip. Oh, mm. OK. That's my name. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it was an old football nickname back in the Newdown days. A bloke called Kenny Wilson gave me the nickname. Um, get on the Gus bus. Get on the bus, Gus, is what it was. So that's what right. It, yeah. Okay. Good to know. Well, look. I won't tell the rest of the story. Okay. All yeah. right. Uh, maybe uh, <laughs> for another time. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Gould. It's been absolutely sensational catching up with you Pleasure. and meeting you for the first time, so it's not really hope a catch-up. Hope we made some sense. <laughs> uh, yeah, you definitely did. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Pleasure. And um, good luck with your mission to uh, turn the Warriors into a rugby league powerhouse. Thank you.